Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, my name is Doreen Weisenhaus. I'm an associate professor uh, here at the Journalism Media Studies Center uh, at the University of Hong Kong. Also, I'm director of the Media Law Project, which sponsors a number of briefings and media law issues and developments and hearings and so forth uh, here um, uh, on campus and elsewhere. So, of course, today's topic fits very well into hot button issues of what's going on in media law today. Uh, I want to welcome everyone here. I know Friday afternoons and evenings are quite popular for other activities. So this must be a very dedicated group here with lots of good questions, I'm sure. Um, we have a very timely topic, which is why I'm sure you're all here. How should Hong Kong handle uh, parodies and secondary uh, creations in its copyright laws? Parodies, satires, mashups abound in today's culture, especially on the internet. But should they be regulated? And if so, how? And what are the options that we need to look at? For the past couple of years, the Hong Kong government has been struggling with these issues uh, as it attempts to try to find ways to amend its current copyright regime to deal with the digital developments. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a consensus as to the way forward. So. Uh, just recently, on July 11th of this year, just a few weeks ago, the Hong Kong government launched a public consultation just on this very topic, the treatment of parodies under the Hong Kong copyright regime. The consultation raised all kinds of questions, questions like what options did the consultation document identify? What are the strengths of each option? What are the weaknesses? Are these options mutually exclusive or can they be combined? Should the government consider other options? These are questions, of course, that are raised by our speakers today as well. To help us wade through these questions are two speakers. Um, many of you who've come to other sessions that we've had here, particularly on copyright, are very familiar with these two speakers. Uh, Peter Yu, who's a leading expert from the US, but of course uh, teaches here um, from time to time at the University of Hong Kong on leading issues of intellectual property and communications law. He is the Kern Family Chair in Intellectual Property and Director of the Intellectual Property Law Center at Drake University Law School in the US. Charles Mock, our second speaker, is an internet uh, entrepreneur, and he's a Hong Kong lawmaker uh, who represents the Information Technology Functional Constituency. And of course, we also have uh, in the audience some representatives from the Hong Kong government, from the Commerce and Economic Development Bureau and the Intellectual Property Department, who are sponsoring um, this consultation. So hopefully they'll be here to also talk, and I know you're here to observe, but also uh, tell us a little bit um, about your views as well. Um, so the format for today uh, is pretty straightforward. Uh, Peter will give a 30-minute presentation in which he'll try to wade through these questions that I just raised and, and point out some of the things that he thinks uh, might be happening. Then uh, we'll have uh, 15 minutes for uh, Mr. Mock to give some of his uh, feedback as a discussant, but also some of the issues that he has been thinking about with his constituents as well. And then uh, we'll open up for a Q&A. Uh, so there'll be plenty of opportunity and time, we hope, for you to ask uh, questions um, from here. and maybe from the government as well, but um, we can't see at this point. Anyway, uh, so let's start out with Peter first. And Peter, you have a presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you all hear me? Okay. Good. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you for Doreen for the uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, I see a lot of old friends, and I'm going to meet a lot of new friends, so it's wonderful. Um, uh, I have, this, this is my hometown, so I always come back uh, during the town breaks, and so that's the time of the year I'm here. And uh, what I want to do is to actually start off by telling you how did we get here. So going back to some of the uh, early days about the digital corporate reform. And so the first consultation is in December 2006. And, um, there are six different issues, and so you can see right here, some is about ISPs, some is about right of public communication, we'll get into that later on, some is about damages, which is much more legal, uh, but those are the issues that are being considered. And so this is the first panel we did based on the first consultation. Uh, it's, a, I, it's very interesting, <laughs> I remember, I, they look very familiar. 
uh, and it's the same people. Uh, it's 2006. Uh, so uh, working together with JMSC, uh, we did a position paper on the digital corporate reform in Hong Kong, and that's in 2007. And then uh, we have uh, an op-ed talking to South Carolina Morning Post, and one of the key questions we try to address is how should we shape the digital future of Hong Kong? Because at that time, they're trying to figure out how to use the consultation process to uh, further develop the corporate system, and that's a very good opportunity for us to consider that. The second consultation, April 2008, with some preliminary proposals. Uh, we have another position paper, and that's in 2008. And then we also have an op-ed focusing on an important issue at that point. It's about form shifting, uh, form shifting exception. And then later that year in October, uh, also sponsored by JMSC as well as others, uh, we have the official launch of Creative Commons uh, Hong Kong and the legal lead uh, right here. LSD is right there and Yahoo is over there as well. And so uh, that was the official launch uh, in that year. And those are the leads. And uh, the director of uh, the JMSC, uh, Ying Chen, is the uh, public, uh, public lead at the moment. And then in November 2009, there's a legislative council proposal. And then the amendment bill is in 2011. And so, so a lot of people are very <laughs> concerned about uh, the amendment bill. And some actually describe it as the online Article 23. So Article 23 is the article in the basic law about uh, public security. And this one, they compare the, the uh, strong enforcement of copyright to uh, Article 23 within cyberspace. And then there are also protests. So here you can see right here, freedom of speech right here, and se as, as, uh, secondary creations right here. And now we have a third consultation that brings us to what we have at the moment. And so what I want to do is to focus my uh, remaining time on this consultation and give you some ideas about what's going on. Uh, when we did the panel uh, the last two times, we actually didn't have concrete uh, language that we can play with. So we talk about the pros and cons uh, in very theoretical terms, but now we actually have the language and I would prefer to focus on language. And in the handout that we have been distributing, I actually uh, include uh, a lot of the proposed language that I think would be good, uh, good for consideration. And the highlighted language is actually things that I would recommend adding. And those who strike out are things that I'm replacing, or I think uh, I would recommend deleting. Now, so for you to understand parity, obviously we got commentary on the, uh, 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 on the political system, right? So some of this will be like that. <laughs> A lot of them is actually Photoshop. Um, that's how they do it. Uh, but sometimes it's about social commentary, right? You don't want to just pay $500 to go to a wedding. And so uh, people will have commentary like that, and then they're complaining about what's going on there. Or uh, you, have, you have other people trying to do things that might not be considered parody. So this is a poster, iRobot. If you just don't like Will Smith, you want to put your hero right here, you can do that. Right? Yeah. You can easily just <laughs> impose it right here. Or you can play with some of those logos out there, right? This is the World Wildlife Fund. But you can play around with this one, right? <laughs> it's pretty cool. Now, but then, if you are the right holder, you're very concerned because the first one is copyrighted, right? So you're the copyright owner, you think that it's going to affect you. The second one is the trademark protection, right? So uh, if you are the right holders, you're very concerned. So we have to get into issue as to how to strike the balance within a corporate system to deal with all this. So what are the options? There are three different options within the consultation document. The first one is to clarify the existing general provisions for criminal sanction. The second one is to introduce a specific criminal exemption for parity. The third one is to introduce a fair deal exception for parity. One big question is that, well, are those all three options that we can have, or can we have more? So the question is, well, can we have option four? And that is quite important. Another question that is important is that, well, do we need to choose between option one, option two, and option three? In some of the, um, some of the reports I've read from the media, and also some of the people I've talked to, they actually tell me which option they prefer. Right? So that is under the assumption that 
you have to pick which one. Is it option one, is it option two, is it option three? The position I take is actually, well, we, it's much better for us to look at the different goals. Because they have different strengths, they have different weaknesses, and they do different things. So it's much better, instead of calling option, maybe look at the different goal we're trying to do. The first one is to clarify the existing general provisions. The second one is to introduce something, and the third one is the same thing. And I think that might be a better way, because at least we can consider all of them in a holistic fashion. So let's start with the first option. So this is uh, uh, 118 of the corporate ordinance. It's about offenses in relation to making or dealing with infringing articles. If you have really good eyesight, you can see it. If not, it's <laughs> not a problem. Um, the most important thing is to remember that this is about large-scale corporate infringement. That's the target. Now, this is the blow-up version. Uh, 1G is important because it's about uh, distribution and infringing copy. And that is a big issue right here to such an extent as to affect prejudicially the corporate owner. And we actually will have to get into that later on. And for those of you who are um, attentive, you'll probably remember this actually uh, the provision used for the BitTorrent case. And so uh, the, the person has uploaded three movies up there and then he was charged uh, for uh, violating this provision and he was sent to jail uh, for three months. And so, uh, that's the provision. Uh, so uh, within the consultation paper, uh, we talked about whether we should try to figure out how to deal with the issue about economic prejudice. So right here, whether more than trivial economic prejudice is a uh, cost to your corporate owner, and then to further define what's considered as economic prejudice, we have three different factors. So the first one is the nature of the work, second is the mode and scale of distribution, and the third one is whether infringing copy uh, amounts to a substitution of the work. So what's quite interesting, uh, for those of you who have not been following a lot of the uh, discussions or the papers from the uh, either Legislative Council or from the outside, is that there's actually an earlier proposal that includes five different factors. And so that has eventually been narrowed down into three. So here you got five factors, and here you got three factors. What is important for me is that, well, when we uh, condense those five factors into three factors, then we lose out one major thing, and which is this one. And I think it's quite important. And we're thinking about parity, then we don't necessarily need to worry that much about it. But if we take the position that when there are other activities done by users that may not necessarily be characterized as parity, then what is the purpose of distribution and communication is actually quite important. And that's why what I would recommend is that well, when we're trying to decide whether it's going to prejudice, I mean, the purpose is something that we should consider as well, uh, uh, and whether it's by the prosecution or by the judge. And then we also need to think about economic prejudice. Now, so a lot of people are very concerned about more than trivial economic prejudice, and I think this is much better if we have considerable economic prejudice. Now, one question that people will have, or those people who are uh, from the corporate community, they'll probably be shaking their heads, thinking that, well, this is actually not a good idea because you are changing a standard. But my response is that, well, you are not actually not changing a standard because you have the word, uh, you have the phrase in particular right there. The standard, what you got is right here in the purple color, to such an extent as to affect prejudiciary the corporate owner. And the court may take into account the, uh, the, all the circumstances, in particular those issues. So what we're doing is provide emphasis about what we should focus on. So if the emphasis is on large scale corporate infringement, maybe we should go a little bit beyond more than trivial economic prejudice so that we can focus on large scale uh, corporate infringement. Uh, a good example would be uh, commercial piracy, and I think that's quite important. And so it, even if you go for considerable economic prejudice, it will still be covered. And so uh, the emphasis should be set a little bit higher. So the two questions I usually get, the first one is that, well, would the proposed change alter a criminal threshold already established by section 118.1.2. The answer would be no, because the standard will be the purple one. This is only providing emphasis. So the standard will be right there, regardless of whether you're going to increase it. But in terms of providing guidance to the court or the prosecution, that is much better, because they know that this focusing on large-scale copyright infringement or the so-called commercial piracy. The second question that people may ask is, would such a change be consistent with the WTO TRIPS agreement? 
As I mentioned earlier on, we are not changing the legal standard at all. We are just providing more emphasis on what we are focusing on. So if uh, the present uh, 118.1G is actually consistent with the TRIPS agreement, then this will also be consistent. So that is not an issue. The set, uh, with respect to uh, communication to the public, I think uh, it's also quite important to look at the purpose of communication and also whether there's a uh, considerable economic prejudice. This. The second thing I think is quite important to think about is that, well, uh, look at the provision about communication of the work to the public. And so there are two different provisions. The first one is about business for a purpose of an, uh, or in the course of any trade or business. And the second one is if it is not about business to such an extent as to affect prejudicially the corporate owner. And I think one of the issues that is quite important is about, well, how much do you need? So uh, in conversation, uh, actually this afternoon, uh, I was told that in some of the case law, you don't necessarily need to have the whole copy. If you get a portion of it, that will be sufficient. But uh, I think th that is a good point. But at the same time, when we are unsure as to what is considered communication to a public, I think it might be a good idea if we are going to impose criminal penalty uh, to have more clarification as to how big is the portion we need to. And so I would suggest that, well, maybe we should consider something like this. For example, a considerable portion of, or maybe to the extent that uh, a substantial portion will be infringed or something like that. So that we know that if you provide only a small portion, uh, that would not necessarily be actionable. And that's quite important in that respect. So that, uh, when you look at uh, 118, uh, one is actually quite interesting. Every single one has an infringing copy. Now we know that sometimes it's quite difficult, especially when we talk about streaming, when we talk about a lot of the new technology. And that's the reason why we need to change it. So for example, BitTorrent is a very good example. The infringing copy can create a loophole, and so it's important for us not to get stuck within that situation. Uh, streaming is another example. So if you get football games, where you only get a stream of it, you might not get a whole copy, so there's no copy to speak of. And then on top of that, you might not just be talking about PC, you might be talking about other type of communication tools. And so it's quite important uh, for us to uh, consider other options as well. But let me give you two examples. One example is that, well, if you have a highlight of NBA games, so I'm basically dating myself, no LeBron James, no Dwight Howard, uh, all you get is Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, and Michael Jordan. But suppose you get a 10-minute ten, uh, ten clip of the highlights of those players, and you stream it to your friends. You are basically communicating a small portion of the different, uh, different games you collected. Let's say you got 20 games or 40 games you collected, uh, uh, and have, uh, have all the stream uh, with, uh, with the different clip for, let's say, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. But under current provision, uh, you might be open to criminal liability, because what you're doing is communicating to the public regardless of how big the portion of the game is. And that's why I think it's quite problematic when we think about a lot of those fan, fan videos, especially considering that the fact that sometimes the fan videos may be very beneficial to corporate holder in terms of increasing the interest of uh, going to games or increasing the interest of buying the uh, videotapes. Or, uh, and now it's, it's basically DVDs. Sometimes that's okay. We can just wait a little bit. Now, one question people might ask: If you do going to do a fan video of ten minutes, are you going to display some of the sales? Would there be any prejudicial effect? Because I think that's quite important. If you're going to do a parody, there's a very strong argument saying that well, you're not going to display sales, so there will be no prejudicial effect. But think about having a ten-minute clip of the major highlights of basketball players. But there are only so many good plays you can have, right? If you have, let's say, uh, the 20 best uh, kicks uh, uh, within, let's say, um, uh, the present Premier League, then you might be picking all those shots that are very similar to what they're putting on in the highlight tapes. And so would that display the sale? Possibly. But if you look at more than trivial economic prejudice, and so I think that is quite problematic from that standpoint. Uh, so uh, that is uh, one of the examples. Another example is that, well, if you 
want to bring together Star Trek and Harry Potter. We're just too upset that, uh, that, uh, that the Star Trek characters are not hanging out with Harry Potter. And you want to create your own uh, video and stream it out there. Would that be covered by present provision? If you look at the provision right here, you're communicating the work to the public when you're streaming it to others. Right? Regardless of whether you're having the whole video right, uh, or whether you're having the whole movie right there. And I think that's quite important. Uh, because when you think about what we're trying to do within Section 118 of the copyright audience, we try to target large-scale copyright infringement. But when you are having a fan video, that's not necessarily the same. But in the legal language, it's not that clear as to how we can make the distinction. The only hope we can have is that uh, the enforcement authorities would be able to figure out where to draw the line. And I think the difficulty is that a lot of the Nelson community at the moment is not willing to trust the enforcement authorities in drawing the line. And that's why they want more clarification within uh, the provision. And the last one uh, I've added to the uh, provision within a consultation document is about uh, the clarification about uh, the act of sharing a hyperlink. That would not be considered as a uh, cover. Now, for those of us who are law professors or who are law uh, lawyers, uh, we know that the communication to, of the work to the public is actually uh, termified within the copyright. But at the same time, for the public, it's much more difficult for them to understand what's considered a communication of the work to the public. They don't understand the WCT or the WPBT and WIBO treaties. So when they just read the communication to the public, they're wondering what that is. Now, why am I adding this one? Well, because if you look at the Q&A put together by the government, it's actually included that saying uh, whether uh, sharing a link will be, co will be considered as a corporate offense as long as you are not going to distribute an infringing copy of a corporate work. The difficulty, though, is that when you get a Q&A, there's no legal effect. Right? So if you get a Q&A explain to you what is going to be standard, that doesn't necessarily mean that you get the protection within the ordinance. And I think that's quite important for us if that is the position, maybe it's not a bad idea to actually clarify that. Second option, uh, introduce a criminal uh, exemption. So what you got here is, the, uh, so is about the criminal exemption as long as it does not cause more than trivial economic prejudice to a corporate owner. And that is true whether it's about distribution or whether it's about communication. What I would suggest is that, well, because of communication with the public, it's going to be uh, a little bit challenging in terms of trying to figure out, uh, as well as some of the other issues we are facing, uh, maybe a good idea is to think about whether we should actually just focus on whether it amounts to a substitution for the work. I think most people will believe that well, if you're going to display sales of the corporate owner, we need to protect the interest. But once you go beyond that, then there's a debate as to whether it's a good idea to actually have language like a economic prejudice, especially when you have criminal penalty. If you don't have criminal penalty, it's based on civil action, then uh, it will still be a big issue because it can be expensive, it can it require a lot of time. If you have criminal penalty, maybe that is something we should consider. And the reason why I think it would be a good idea is that I'm focusing on large-scale corporate infringement. If that is the target, then maybe it's not a bad idea to focus on substitution of the work. One of the difficulties with respect to economic prejudice is that we are not in the same type of society as the US, the UK, Australia, Canada. In those places, the concept of the phrase is actually not that important. Uh, people are not talk about losing phrase. But when, when we are in Asian society, when the reputation value is so important, you can always find economic prejudice. Because if you're going to create parity, you cause somebody to lose phrase, that can convert into something that can be considered as, as valuable economically. So that makes it much more challenging when we try to measure what's considered as economic prejudice. Now, obviously, you can say that, well, a lot of the enforcement authorities would be relying on case law, relying on the standards used by other countries. But at the same time, I think there's something quite unique about what we consider as, uh, uh, as uh, uh, affecting the economic interest when it actually can implicate your reputation or causing you to lose face. And that's somewhat different from a lot of the Western societies. The other question that people may ask is about the word parity. 
and which is actually similar to option three. So I'll link it together when I talk about option three. So option three is about introducing a fair dealing exception for parity. So one question is about how should we describe this? Should we call it parity? Should we use a different term? And so what I did is put together what other countries have been doing. Australia, parity and Zappai. Canada, parity and Zappai. European Union, caricature, parity and uh, petition. France, parody, British, and caricature. New Zealand, parody, and satire. Uh, United Kingdom, parody, caricature, and prestige. So you got right here. And so you got all four of them together um, uh, for consideration. Uh, one way to understand those, or what's the meaning of those words, is to rely on dictionary. Right? So if you look at uh, the conservation document, they actually include the dic uh, dictionary definition from the, uh, from the Austin English Dictionary. And one question a lot of people ask is that, well, should we include all of this into the legal language so that we know exactly what is considered as a parody, how different it is from a setup? Now, if you are from the Nelson community, I want you to think twice about the strategy. It might be a good idea to provide clarity, but it can also hurt you in the sense that what you expect to be flawed can become the ceiling. So if you're hoping that when we add words like including or such as to make this as a floor, that doesn't mean that eventually it will become the ceiling, say that you cannot go beyond that. Anything that goes beyond the definition right here may not be protected. And I think that is the danger that we have seen in case law in a lot of other countries. When they set up the guidelines, for example, uh, you can use, let's say, a thousand words in order to co be covered within fair use. Eventually, a lot of the publishers will say a thousand words is the maximum limit you have to use below that. And so for those people who are trying to has, uh, push strongly for a definition uh, within a statute, that is something you need to think about, whether it's a good idea. And this type of question actually comes up a lot, because uh, whether it's in a treaty, whether it's in a statute, whenever you define something, you need to think about whether you will be defined the way you expect it, if you want it to be a flaw, we always stay as a flaw, or we become the ceiling, which will backfire on you. And I think that's quite important. And because of what I've seen in a lot of other countries, with respect to both definition and guidelines, I actually would not recommend defining it, uh, because I think it would be a good idea to actually uh, allow the common law system to actually let the definition to evolve. Uh, one big question that people always ask is that, well, then we have to rely on court, right? We can't trust the court. If you're in rule of law society, you can't trust the court. Uh, there's no, no easy way for you to actually deal with the situation. Because whatever you put in the language, if you can't trust the court, they can also do something a lot different. And I think that's quite important to remember. But at the same time, I think it's, it's a fair argument in the sense that by the time you go to court, it already takes a lot of time, it already takes a lot of uh, resources. And so there's, uh, uh, there's understandable concern with respect to why you want more clarity within definition. So with respect to uh, uh, the exception, I think it's important to include those uh, and uh, so that we don't necessarily need to distinguish between what is a parody, what is a satire, uh, uh, what is a caricature, and I think it would be a good idea to do that. And that's actually the similar recommendation, I think, from McGowan's review in the UK, saying that well, we should not try to distinguish uh, between uh, all of these terms. The second thing I think is quite important with respect to this exemption is that we should, need, uh, we should think a little bit more about moral rights. So uh, section 9 to talk about the right to object to derogatory treatment of the work. That means when you're going to uh, affect the integrity of the work, uh, a lot of the authors will be very upset uh, with how you're going to degrade the, uh, the work to a point that it affects the reputation of the author. And I think it's quite important to actually include an exception right there, so that uh, you'll be saying that, well, as long as you're doing fair dealing with the work for the purposes of parody, satire, caricature, and prestige, that will not be covered within Section 92. Now, one question that people always ask is, uh, why is that important with respect to, to uh, uh, moral rights? Because that is something that people usually don't talk that much about. One is important because when you're talking about moral rights, it's the author that's suing, not the corporate holder because you're protecting the reputation of the author. So the, uh, the person that's suing is actually quite different. Number two is that uh, there actually is quite interesting example. So 
Uh, on the left hand side, you got a CCTV legal affairs uh, program. On the right hand side, you got the promise, which is a movie, would you? And, um, and uh, when a blogger makes the two together, he comes up with something like the bloody case that started with a sting bun. <laughs> and you can actually get it from YouTube. Uh, it's social commentary, you got a lot of interesting things, but it's also a criticism of how bad uh, the promise is as a movie. <laughs> so obviously, uh, Tao Anko is not very happy with respect to what's going on, right? So uh, he threatened to sue the blogger for both copyright infringement and defamation. And this is actually what he said uh, uh, with the translation. I think this parody has exceeded the normal bounds of issuing commentary and opinion. It's an arbitrary alteration of someone else's property, intellectual property. So if you're going to make a parody, and the parody is so successful that you're going to uh, hurt the reputation of the author or the original work, then you allow other people to actually go back and sue you for hurting a reputation that doesn't provide you a very good way to make a parody. And I think that's why the exception is uh, quite important with respect to this area. So the, uh, one question that may come up is that are options two and option three mutually exclusive? Because the first one is about criminal exception, second one is about the civil exemption. So option two is right here, option three is about fair dealing exception for parody. So one way to look at this one is that on the left hand side, the yellow color is option two, exception for criminal liability. On the right hand side is the orange color, exception for civil liability. When you don't have copyright infringement, you also don't have criminal liability. So the orange color is actually the whole set of the whole thing. So we're talking about some small subset with respect to option two. So the typical response is that, well, because it's the larger set, if you get option three, you don't need option two. Because once there's no civil liability, there will be no uh, infringement, then you cannot go for criminal liability. Right? So uh, that's, uh, that's the normal reaction to that question. It's actually not sim as simple as this. If you actually look at the language right here, on the left hand side is the language from the consultation document uh, for option two. On the right hand side is the language for the fair dealing exception for question three, uh, for option three. The condition right here is, does not cost more than trivial economic prejudice to your copyright owner. In order for you to get benefit of this exemption for criminal liability, you need to fulfill this condition. In order for you to get the benefit of the exemption for civil liability, you need to have fair dealing. How do you define fair dealing? Well, fair dealing can be looked at based on the different factors. So, for example, in section 38 and 41A of the corporate orders, we have four different factors. They are not exhaustive, so it's actually quite similar to a lot of the factors used by other countries. The purpose and nature of dealing, the nature of the work, the amount have been used, the effect on the potential market. If you look at the four factors, these two are actually quite similar. So what does that mean? If you do a fair, uh, the four factor analysis on this side, you prevail on this factor, but you lose on the other three. You will still be subject to liability on this side for criminal liability. And I think that is a good reason to show that that the uh, option three is actually not a larger set. that covers everything. So when you look at what's going on here, this is actually a much better example. So that means if it doesn't fall in here, cover within the fair dealing exception, then there's still a question as to whether there's criminal liability with respect to those work that will not fit within either the four factor at uh, the last factor of the fair dealing uh, factors or with respect to whether there's any prejudicial effect. So this is a little bit abstract. So let me give you an example. Uh, actually, I can give you two examples. The first one is if you're going to have a T-shirt that's for commercial sale, you try to make a political commentary. Uh, and you suppose you have a very interesting parody uh, image that you want to include on a T-shirt. But the reason why you are selling the T-shirt is you want to raise money so that you can raise money for a campaign or for a protest. So everything is done for political reason. In a lot of countries, that would be considered as political speech. That would be covered. And, uh, but when you think about the four-factor analysis, 
would this going to affect the potential market? The answer would be no. Because people will buy this one and also buy the original one. But would this necessarily fulfill uh, the uh, first factor analysis based on the nature of the use or the purpose of the use? The answer is it depends. Because it's commercial use. It's not non-commercial. Right? So with respect to the first factor, you might lose. And so it, it, if you lose on the first factor, and the court decide not to balance all the four factors in a way that will favor you, that means you lose respect to fair dealing. You will not get the civil liability exception because it's not considered fair dealing. Then the next question we want to ask is that, well, what about criminal liability? Well, if we have a criminal liability exception, then you can still look at the conditions, saying whether there's any prejudicial effect. But if we don't have the special exception for criminal liability, that means you basically lose this one uh, you are opening yourself to criminal liability because you lose on the fair dealing analysis. And I think that is quite problematic. Another example, which I think is actually quite difficult for me, is that you got two TV stations. One is TVA, the other is TVB. <laughs> and TVB happens to be quite popular, and TVA is not. And so TVA figures out, maybe I should scoop some of the programs on TVB. Uh, to attract the, uh, uh, attract the audience. So what they've decided is to use some of the news reporting program from DVB and show it in a humorous way <coughs> so that they can talk about what's going on here. But that is quite difficult because TV obviously is uh, having all this programming to make money, to get audience. So if you are going to do the analysis, the question you ask is, uh, will, will it display sales from TVB? The answer would be no. Because you're going to create a parody and people who want to watch that show would still want to watch the current affairs program or news program, because that, those are not substitute. But would this necessarily be beneficial? To, uh, would this necessarily allow TVA to get the benefit of fair dealing? The answer would be probably not, because this is definitely for commercial purpose. But then there's still the next question. Do we want to have criminal liability or just civil liability? Because if you talk about this situation, maybe it's all about money. And so if they can pay the damages, that's over. You don't want to vote for criminal liability. And so I think it's quite important to, for us to separate option two from option three, because they are not necessarily covering, uh, uh, they are overlapping, but the, the option three is actually not uh, covering everything you got within option two. The final one is actually not in the consultation paper. If you remember what I asked early on, is that, well, can we have option three? So option four is what I pro uh, propose is introducing an exception for non-commercial uh, user-generated content. For those of you who are from the copyright community, sorry about that. You're go not going to like this one. Uh, but I think it's quite important uh, for this reason. Most of the things people are doing actually would not fit within parody. Right? We can try to talk about parody and we can try to say that while they're making comment. But when you think about a lot of the things people are doing on YouTube, people are doing uh, at home and then just post it on Facebook and share it with others. Those are non-commercial user generated content. But that doesn't mean that there's a parody because they're not using uh, the uh, original work to make a comment. Let me give you some example. So what I've taken here is actually from the uh, Canadian Copyright Act. Uh, so C11 is the latest uh, evolution act that has been adopted. And so here, again, we have the provision right here. Uh, those are for the people with very good eyesight. And then you get a blow up version right here. So 29.1 is the exception about non-commercial research and the content. There are a lot of specific conditions. So that is actually not necessarily uh, a, a, a broad exemption so that people can do whatever they want to. For example, you have to be an individual. You cannot be a company. In order for you to get the exemption, you have to use an existing work that has been published or otherwise made available to the public. This is the key. You have to create a new work. You cannot just use it uh, in other people's work uh, to, to do whatever you want to. You have to create a new work. And so the idea is that, well, if we are talking about quid pro quo, in order for you to get the exemption, you need to do something in return that is socially beneficial. And creating a new work is one of those uh, options that uh, the Canadian legislature has chosen. An additional condition, it has to be solely for non-commercial purposes. Uh, those people who are from the user community 
of our Latin community will probably not be that happy with respect to this particular work. So this is actually very difficult to figure out what's causing solely for non-commercial use. If you get some advertising revenue, would that be considered as solely for non-commercial use? The answer would probably not. Yes, it's not solely. But at the same time, I think we have to draw the line somewhere. And I'm comfortable in drawing the line based on the long deliberation of the Canadian legislature with respect to this particular provision. Uh, you also need to mention the source if it's reasonable in the circumstances to do so. Now, this is actually quite unique uh, with respect to the moral rights protection in Canada. They always include that it has to be reasonable in circumstances to do so. So that's actually a escape route uh, for those who are concerned about too strong protection with respect to moral rights. And then the, last, uh, this, uh, the uh, third one is you have to have reasonable grounds to believe uh, it's not, in, not infringing copyright. So you cannot just get a movie and then add your own name there and say, I created a new one. This is the way to work because that's likely to be infringing copyright. Right? So you need to draw a line right there. And then D is the requirement that it does not have substantial adverse effect, including that the work is not a substitute. Right? If you're going to display sales of the copyright holder, of course you will not be able to get a benefit from this exemption. So the, the example that uh, 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 we, uh, would be very useful is about a lot of the things you can see on YouTube. If you go on there, you can find that there are a lot of things there that will not be considered parity, but that will fit within this non-commercial usagerity content exception. Uh, some of the secondary creations example will also fit within there. So an example would be but when people are just singing the song in the bathroom or in the living room, would it be considered parody? So for example here is the young Justin Bieber singing a song by Justin Timberlake, Crimey a River. And what he's doing is not really making a statement about how he's younger than Justin Timberlake, right? He's not making a comment about how this song is actually a, a bad version of pop music. He's just trying to imitate and trying to get his name out. And so if you think about whether this is considered parody, the answer would be no. Would this be considered non-usagerity content, uh, uh, non-commercial usagerity content? The answer would be yes, until he got a lot of advertising uh, revenues. So th this is a very good example of what you get. Uh, within the local context, think about people performing uh, in high school or the secondary school here in Hong Kong with an assembly performance. If they're going to perform a popular song in assembly and they record it and they post it up on the web, is this considered a parody? The answer would be no, this is not a parody. They are not making a statement. But are they trying to provide user the content that's for non-commercial purposes, sharing with the fans, the answer would be yes. And at the moment, if you look at the provisions we uh, included in a lot of the, uh, in, in the consultation document, non-commercial user generated content is actually not covered. That means you will not be able to get away from uh, both civil and criminal liability. And that's something that's quite important. Uh, actually, in the US, during the uh, SOPA debate, SOPA and people debate, one big question is that, well, if we have SOPA and people, then Justin Bieber will have gone to jail. Maybe that's a good thing for a lot of people, but that's not the focus of this topic. Second one is that when you think about this one, this is a, it's perfect, it's let's go crazy, and this really crazy. Um, so you got baby dancing to a song, let's go crazy. And let's go crazy happens to be a song copyrighted and uh, uh, performed by Prince in 1984. And so the, uh, the attorneys from Prince sent a cease and desist letter to both YouTube as well as others and say that you need to take down the video. So the parent of that, uh, that, uh, that toddler uh, took the video to share it with their friends because they're living in all different places. If they're going to send an email to others, it will take up a lot of bandwidth. So just upload it to YouTube is a very convenient way to do it. The problem though is that this baby is dancing to the song that's copyrighted and Prince owns the copyright in the song and that's playing in the background. Would you say this is a parody? No, right? Would you believe that the parent of this toddler should be subject to criminal liability? So that is what I'm talking about, right? When you think about it, and I think that is going to be very difficult to draw the line in the sense that some people may actually want to use this as a loophole. Right? So if we are concerned about the corporate holders' interests, 
you need to figure out a way to draft it so that we will not hurt the interest of the corporate holder. But at the same time, would I say that this will be right, that we cast the criminal net so wide that the parent of this baby will actually be subject to criminal liability? My answer would be no. I don't think that is something I want to do. So one question that a lot of the policymakers uh, will ask is about Section 301. And uh, for those of you who are not in a policy community, Section 301 is a process that's done by the US Trade Representative, where the different corporate industries will, uh, re uh, uh, will uh, uh, send a submission to them. And now there's actually a hearing in the Obama administration and saying what type of uh, uh, harm that other countries have been done to the corporate interest. And so one of the big concerns is that, well, the interac International Intellectual Party Alliance will collect all the problems in different countries with respect to corporate laws and put it in a report and submit it to the US Trade Representative. So if we're going to have, for example, 29.1, this user generated content exception, then the, uh, the Section 301 report will say that, well, Hong Kong is very bad in copyright law. We should just put it on the watch list or priority watch list. So I have some bad news for you. Look at what they have written in the current report 2013. The government should focus on the passing of the present bill as it is, and then start another round of public consultation on other issues as soon as possible. And that's actually quite interesting, because when I was speaking in the LIE conference in Canada, uh, where they have just passed the, co the new corporate debt, one thing I, I, I mentioned is that when with the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, the TPP, you have to change the whole corporate debt, because a lot of the things you have passed will actually not be consistent with the TPP intellectual property chapter. I get the shocking eyes looking at me, because they spend I, I, I already four bills trying to uh, have the corporate reform. So I, I can't remember whether it's like four years, six years, uh, to, in order for them to get that. The last thing they want to hear is that just when they get the new corporate debt, they have to change it again because now they're signing on to the TPP, the trans pacific Partnership Agreement. And so if the concern is that, well, we don't really want uh, to have Hong Kong to be uh, blacklisted on the Section 301 report submitted by the industries, I think it's too late. Even if we include all the provisions, they are still hoping that well, we should start another round of consultation as soon as possible. But think about the political capital in Hong Kong. If we finish this corporate consultation, are we ready to start another one in the next month? <laughs> right? The answer would be no. But what's really shocking for, for those people who are concerned about the current reform, what they're asking for, one is the extension of the corporate term, online border control measures, specific measures come back to P2P file sharing, uh, additional uh, damages, statutory debt damages, we got that, this one, if we cover that, and then uh, uh, action against repeated offenders, so similar to gradual response uh, Adobe. So those are things they want to be in the consultation. So if we're going to include a lot of those issues here, uh, we will still not satisfy them, because those are issues they are expecting to be considered very soon. And so I think that's quite a problem for a lot of countries with respect to what's going on uh, with respect to the Section 301 process. So basically what they're asking for is that we well, introduce a provision that's been being negotiated in either the anti counterfeiting trade agreement or the IP chapter in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. The other thing which I'm cynical about the Section 301 process is that no matter what we do, it's going to be very difficult because Hong Kong is always the gateway to China. If the IP protection in China is not improving, it's going to be very difficult uh, for us to, uh, to earn very high score with respect to uh, intellectual property protection. Part of it is guilty by association, but the other part of it is that they're using Hong Kong as a leverage to negotiate with China. If Hong Kong is going to increase the protection, then they can go to China and say that, well, Hong Kong has already increased. You better increase as well. And so that's the bargaining chip. And I think that is much more difficult than just saying, what is the right protection for the corporate holders within the country? Uh, are there other issues for consideration that we should consider? Uh, one thing I think is quite important is think about fair use. Uh, so I, I'll focus on uh, three brief issues that might be useful for us to think about. So fair use, the interesting thing about fair use is that it's open-ended. There are the different factors we consider. We have something similar within our corporate audience. But we have fair dealing, which is very specific, 
is to perform research and part study for criticism and review something quite specific about what we should do. If you look at a lot of other countries, U.S., the Philippines, Singapore, Israel, they already have various provision within there. And Australia and Ireland is now considering where they should switch from fair dealing to fair use. So one quick question we have with respect to parity is that, well, are we too late trying to go back to a system that some countries are now abandoning? Or should we just move forward so that we can live from into the corporate system in the 21st century? if that is the way a lot of countries are going. So one question with fair use. The other question is that if we are not ready to introduce fair use, can we just do it like other countries, for example, Singapore here? We have fair data for any purpose, right? So that you have very broad thing that will cover uh, even the non-commercial usage area content. So that you do a factor analysis to determine whether this would be good or not. Second thing I think is quite important is about what we call the Crown Copyright in the old days and now the government copyright. If you look at Australia, uh, a lot of the government documents has already been ported to a Creative Commons license so that people can copy it uh, any way they want to. And the reason why I think it's important is that there are a lot of raw materials that are actually produced by government that can be quite beneficial to the community. So I, I, I know that Hong Kong earlier has a case uh, with respect to the maps produced by government. But let me give you an example why this can be useful. Think about an app that's relying on the content and the data that's provided by government. Without all the maps right here, it's much more difficult for them to actually develop the app. So if our idea is that well, we want to have more development with respect to information technology, or we want to compete with other places, maybe that is something we want to consider. Because the taxpayer has already paid for the, the, all the content to be produced by the government. Maybe it's not a bad idea to do that. Uh, I was actually just in Singapore yesterday, I'm coming back from there, and they keep on talking about the IP Hub master plan for the next 10 years. Right? If we think about Hong Kong, people th uh, from Hong Kong always want to compare with uh, Singapore. But if they talk about IP Hub, then we should also think about how we're going to set up the IP Hub here. And what would be a good way, and one way is actually think about the government produced content. The final one I think is also quite important is that when you think about the orphan works, this is actually a very difficult issue. What do you mean by orphan works? We don't know exactly who the authors are. Why is it important? Because we always expect that you know exactly who the copyright owner is so that you can get a license. But that might not be true. There are a lot of works on the internet. You have no way of finding out who they are. And a lot of countries are now actually exploring how to deal with orphan works. So what, the, what I want to end on is to give you a few reasons why it's important for us to think about a parity exception. The first one is that we want to develop a commenting culture because of what's going on in Hong Kong at the moment. When people are paying attention to current affairs or people get frustrated with what's going on here. And I think parity will actually be a good way for people to start talking about what's going on here or providing comments. Second thing is that well, freedom of speech is always a big issue. Uh, to some extent, I feel that Hong Kong is in a catch-22 catch situation. If we don't provide uh, strong protection for freedom of speech, we'll be criticized by Western media. If we don't provide stronger corporate protection, we'll also be criticized by the Western media. If we provide stronger corporate protection that will trample on the protection for freedom of speech, we will also be criticized by the, the Western media. And I think that's going to be quite difficult, and that is an important balance we do strike. Third one is that the internet. Uh, the internet changed the way we communicate, and this is actually taken from the consultation paper from the UK government. Parodies have become part and parcel of online social interaction, with parody works adorning Facebook walls and trending on Twitter. The modern public's response to an event is as likely to be expressed through fo uh, Photoshop competitions and downfall parodies as through traditional comment, argument, and debate. So the way people communicate has already changed. When we talk about Create Hong Kong, we want to provide creativity. Parody is a very good way to do it. Same thing for user-generated content. Parody can actually make money. This is a very, uh, uh, best, it is one of the 30, I think the top 30 or top 40 best-selling movies uh, in Hong Kong. Right? So this is made out of parody. Obviously, for those who are into copyright, you know that some of them are licensed parodies, so it's somewhat different. And then there's also a big issue, what's, what's going on at the international level. 
if you look at other countries, they have been doing that. Even at the uh, international level, WIPO just has a treaty on limitation exception for the visually impaired people. So it's not always that we need stronger protection. We also need to strike the balance with respect to the limitation exception. Uh, and then, of course, we have the competition with respect to Singapore. So what I want to end on is this one. We have been spending so much time talking about corporate reform, starting from 2006, and now it's 2030. I can see why a lot of corporate holders are very frustrated with the long process and not getting anything done. But at the same time, we also have major concern with respect to some of the issues, especially with respect to criminal penalties. Dragging on the corporate reform may not necessarily be a good idea for both parties. And I think that is quite important for us to think about. And how we should do it, it depends on the balance. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. And now, Charles, your response. Well, well, well. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, Peter's very deep and detailed analysis, I think, is great. Uh, and uh, uh, particularly, I think, uh, with a look at what the other countries' jurisdictions have been doing and so on, is, uh, is going to be very, very useful for I think our upcoming consultation and legislative process and so I want to make sure that we can get a hold of that video because I think we need to watch it over and over again and probably share it with other people. I hope you will release the copyright to allow us to do that. No, I don't have copyright. You don't have copyright. We okay. have the copyright. Do you have the copyright? Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, whoever, whoever has it. <laughs> right. And uh, I, 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 first of all, I, I want to keep it short but um, just a few things I want to uh, uh, say. I think uh, the way that uh, Peter ends his presentation with uh, some of the examples and comparison with Singapore and some of the points that he made about uh, how we want to uh, uh, make Hong Kong a creative city and uh, in a way uh, being an IT hub and compete with uh, uh, Singapore and other countries and so on. I mean, it really uh, hit me uh, uh, hard that uh, uh, because bec before I was coming into this meeting, actually, I had another meeting of two and a half hours, uh, and actually when I left uh, that meeting, it, it was still going on. Uh, we were having a meeting with the Privacy Commissioner's Office and a couple of people there, and we had a whole bunch of people from the mobile industry, mobile application developers, you know, talking and arguing with them with them about the uh, treatment of uh, public uh, or person, or the so-called personal data in the public domain. As you know, that was uh, that is another issue that has been recently flared up uh, because the privacy commissioner considered one application called Do No Evil to be uh, out of bound uh, according to the current privacy legislation. And uh, it is, uh, and, and uh, of course, to most of us, we would think that hey, this is already in the public domain. So what's what's going on? So uh, without going into detail, and certainly this is not the topic uh, for discussion here today, but uh, looking at that, you know, it really hits us hard that a lot of times when we, I mean, our laws and regulations that we have uh, can really affect the way that we, the, the environment that we have in order to, de to develop real creativity and innovation. Uh, looking back at uh, the consultation that uh, Peter repeatedly said that uh, started in 2006, uh, it's been dragging on for seven or, or more years. Uh, I still remember when the, first, when the government came to us uh, and talked about that, us being people in the industry, and uh, talking about uh, copyright protection. That the, the title that they, that they used at the time was copyright protection in the digital environment. Now, uh, of course, from the beginning, many of us felt that that was somewhat misplaced uh, by somewhat making a assumption that copyright protection would be the only thing that uh, that uh, you could do in order to create a better environment for uh, fostering a better environment for the creative industry, copyright protection definitely is very important. But uh, you know, just as the example that Peter was pointing out about uh, Creative Commons and so on, you know, this is exactly that the, the the world trend uh, which is going also at the same time uh, talking about copyleft. 
uh, and uh, so um, the 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 some it it, it hits us even in 2006 that uh, some of these concepts that were used when we were developing uh, our, the consultation and our future legislation and so on has been um, backward or or behind uh, right from the beginning uh, before it started and so. Um, I still remember five years ago we were in another room over there uh, having a similar uh, forum and uh, three of us were sitting here. Uh, uh, we did not, honestly, I don't believe uh, we had a lot of uh, detailed discussion about parity uh, and uh, this so-called secondary uh, creation at the time. So uh, that actually also, uh, to me, shows that yes, uh, in a way, what Peter uh, said about, you know, you don't want to prolong these consultation legislative process. You know, you do it when whichever, you know, you, you, you have and, uh, uh, and you do it right there. It, it's right. I mean, the longer you drag it on, uh, the, uh, the, the list of laundry list of things that you need to do and need to be uh, 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 debated, uh, not to mention the, the, the things that you need, you should have done a long time ago, still left undone. Not only that, but actually, uh, uh, it, it just get, makes the work harder and harder because there's so many of these things that, that haven't been done. Uh, so indeed, uh, parity, the issue about parity or secondary creation uh, didn't really flare up uh, until uh, almost close to the time, uh, about a year or two ago, when the government was ready to put up the bill to the Legislative Council. and. Uh, so uh, it did probably catch the government by surprise at the time, but uh, okay, uh, in light of time, uh, uh, let me move on to just uh, giving a little bit of comment, uh, also you know, feedback, uh, uh, responses to uh, what Peter talked about uh, in his comment about the current uh, consultation and, uh, for example, the three options that the government talked about. Indeed, I have probably uh, a few, just a few comments, responses, and maybe some questions. Well, first of all, uh, talking to uh, many of these uh, internet users in particular, I think, uh, of course, you know, they are, the tr <laughs> they, they are probably the ones that, uh, that, uh, that uh, we need to uh, we need to talk to the most because they seem to be uh, most uh, uh, ag uh, against uh, uh, this this uh, legislation for whatever reason. Uh, uh, I'll go back into that uh, later on, which I, I uh, believe there are a lot of misunderstanding about what this legislation is trying to do on their level. But in any way, uh, I think they, first of all, they pointed out that they uh, uh, really do not understand uh, what all these four uh, words uh, are talking about, parody, satire, caricature, and uh, pastiche, and so on. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, Peter, Peter actually covered that point very well as well, about uh, their concern about not understanding the real definition about these, uh, these uh, uh, terms. And Peter said, I think explains it very well that uh, you don't want the floor to become the ceiling. But on the other hand, uh, that is a difficult uh, battle to 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 fight or to try to get the users to understand it because in their mind, people want clarity. I mean, average citizen want clarity. I mean, maybe help me, law professor. How do you explain to people about these concepts? But uh, a lot of times, you know, they, they're, uh, and right now they're saying that I, I don't know what you're talking about. So I'm worried that uh, whatever protection or exemption you provided under these, uh, 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 under these terms, uh, I'm not going to get them. Uh, so that, that, that is the real con uh, uh, con uh, worry that they have. Um, uh, but and, and in a way, I, I, I'm also worried that whether or not uh, what they want can be satisfied because they might what they want might be clarity to the point that they will be guaranteed that they will never be prosecuted, uh, which uh, is we don't, we know that will be very difficult. But in a way, you know, uh, that's that seems to be what they are asking for. But uh, to be more, uh, but another rather more practical uh, uh, concern that they seem to have also uh, pointed out, which I hope we can deal with, is that they are saying that uh, these four terms, parody, satire, and so on, these four uh, words, uh, if they look into the dictionary, they don't find that uh, 
it has anything to do with derivative or secondary uh, creation. So they're saying, okay, you tell me to look into the dictionary, so I look into the dictionary. The dictionary talks about parody, but they don't talk about uh, secondary creation. So this is a trap. Um, so this is a trap because what I do may not fall into the dictionary uh, 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 definition for these words and so on. So that that uh, is also feed another feedback that I got. Uh, there's a, there are also uh, quite a bit of concern about hyperlinking and uh, and so on. Uh, Peter, maybe you can uh, go into that in a while um, uh, because uh, uh, there seems to be a lot of concern about the responsibility of uh, not just uh, sharing hyperlinks but uh, uh, sharing. Uh, whether or not sharing is uh, sharing on social networks, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, and so on, or Google Plus, and so on. Whether or not that sort of uh, uh, activity, behavior, is the same as what you uh, seem to have been talking about, uh, uh, you know, in terms of hyperlinking, because they, is it the same? Uh, so there are concerns that, hey, uh, not even just those people who are creating or, or, or creating these works of uh, secondary creation. Um, what about even those people who are uh, just sharing? You know, I don't actually, I, I don't, I don't do Photoshop and all those things uh, <laughs> well. So uh, actually, I just share. So will I be uh, in, in getting myself into trouble? Uh, okay, and uh, of course. Uh, uh, many of them also look at the uh, all these three options. Um, uh, Peter uh, uh, was talking about exactly the the question I had in mind right away. Uh, on the surface, yes, option three would be better than two, but uh, of course, it can't be as simple as that. So, uh, what about those examples? Do we uh, can 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 from the internet users' point of view, they want to be show a lot of examples to say, okay, what is, let's say, in option three, but not in option two, and in option two, but not in option three, and so on. Uh, another uh, question, another suggestion that one of my colleagues in Legislative Council uh, has uh, suggested is that what about all of the above? Is it possible that uh, we don't pick one option, but we pick all of the above? So which means that if I fall into this, I get this. If I fall into that, I get that, and uh, I pick the best option I get, let's say. Or unless I don't fall into any of these you know, options and so on. Can I get all of the above? Uh, now that Peter put up uh, option four, uh, which is well, very nice beyond priority. Uh, so, uh, what about all of the above too? You know, <laughs> uh, uh, or or should I ask? Uh, option four is it a superset, complete superset, covering all the uh, possibilities in option two and three? You shaking your head. So so and then okay. So some people will be some people will be asking, uh, can I get all of the above? Which, which means that, uh, 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 first of all, I don't know. I mean, uh, in terms of drafting legal languages, <laughs> does, can can it be like that? And secondary, uh, uh, you know, you know, is it anyway? Is it feasible? So uh, uh, that's another question that uh, many of us do have. Some uh, of my colleagues have also suggested that. Uh, uh, they put in other reasons for exceptions, uh, for example, public interest, which I think might be too wide and difficult to inter inter uh, interpret. Uh, some, or, or, or for example, uh, making fair comments and so on, but that probably is already covered in my mind. Uh, so, you know, uh, so to close, uh, I think the situation right now, I think if I look at the uh, views and the uh, uh, coming from the different point of view standpoint from different constituents. Uh, understandably, uh, uh, from the right holders, from the copyright holders point of view, uh, uh, they, I, I mean, Peter said it well that uh, they've been waiting for a long time. And I think originally, uh, when we look at this copyright ordinance, you know, uh, and the amendment, uh, other than the fact that we have to try to make it as up to date to the technology as possible, the reality is that uh, hey, we're, you know, copyright protection, like it or not, is still a big part of it. A big, uh, the major part of why we were doing it. Although we understand that we have to balance it with other other priorities, but the problem is the longer we don't have uh, uh, an update in the legislation, they have uh, no way or limited means or more expensive means to deal with truly large-scale infringements 
and that is the reality. So, uh, in fact, uh, so uh, well, there are some right holders here. Maybe they can tell us what they think later on. Uh, but uh, even last July, uh, just before the government gave up on putting this bill through LegCo uh, in the last legislative session, uh, they they actually even come to a compromise of saying that they would agree to the an exemption for civil liability at the time. Uh, which was actually a, a step that they decided to make, a comp sort of a compromise call uh, that they made uh, at the time. Uh, I think in their mind, they are fully realizing that uh, the longer this is holding on, you know, there's no, not to their benefit, and uh, certainly uh, it, uh, 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 it doesn't help them deal with the real problem. Now, from the internet service provider's point of view, of course, they want the uh, safe harbor provision that is included in the rest of the bill that we are cons cons consulting at the moment, okay? Uh, uh, so, uh, because that is actually, of course, very important for uh, our IT industry's environment, and particularly with all those data centers that are build being built in Hong Kong, they actually, it is uh, increasingly a, a question mark that, uh, uh, international companies have to have to answer, uh, uh, saying why why Hong Kong if there's no safe harbor for for data centers or internet service providers, but the from and and from the public's point of view, if we talk to most people on the street, and I think the view hasn't really changed since last year to this year, is that most people on the street, which means that they're just viewers on the internet users, not the people who are really doing these uh, uh, derivative works. Uh, these people actually think that there's no big deal, what's the problem? I think that's still a, a, a general uh, 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 feeling from the public. And from the user's point of view, the big, this is where the biggest problem I think we, we, we have to deal with, is that first of all, there's still some degree of misconception that uh, this, is a, 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 this is a draconian law, this is Article 23, that this law is trying to uh, secretly take uh, rights away from them. Uh, even though this is, uh, we're talking about giving some exemption, whether you're talking about option one or two or three or f uh, two or three or four, uh, it is we're talking about giving them, ex them exemption. But some, uh, and I, I t I've talked to quite a number of users. I mean, those who have really looked into the matter more, they seem to understand that uh, hey, having some exemption is better than no exemption. But then again, you ha we have to understand. I also understand. That I also see that some of them are saying that if we don't get the best deal. Then maybe this, maybe I'll stick with no deal. But then again, I mean, having no deal means that they have no nothing to protect them, uh, which is even worse in my mind. So uh, that mentality. How do you? How do we explain that mentality? The only way we could explain that mentality, unfortunately, is the all these problems in Hong Kong. It's a total mistrust of the government. Anything that the government's trying to do, you know, there must be some secret schemes of, of uh, you know, some conspiracy behind it and so on. And to some, some people, actually, I, I have to say that maybe there's more minority of, 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 the, of the user community that might be just thinking that uh, if, as long as we defeat the bill, bill uh, uh, that, that would mean that it's a victory against the government. Uh, uh, so anyway, that 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 is uh, sort of the worry that I have. How do we get the message across to the to these users that uh, they can really sit down and look, take a close look at uh, what they're being offered and uh, try to get the best they can get? Uh, in the end, of course, I think it's, uh, it's got to be a compromise between uh, all these parties uh, and the government. Uh, so far, they have been saying that they are keeping an open mind about. Uh, all these options and maybe other options. I hope they will make sure that they they uh, they do that. Uh, uh, and in closing, I just want to uh, mention one other point that uh, there's uh, sometimes some uh, there might be an undercurrent uh, that some users uh, may still have some views about the rest of the bill that we are not consulting at the moment, uh, which includes all those take down uh, policies and the safe harbor and so on. Uh, uh, I, I don't know how. Well, actually, I know that they, they. Some of them do have a do have. Some of them. Uh, uh, they, they. I don't know what each one of them think, but uh, they, they, they. Uh, they are not sure what the government is trying to do. They. They might think that okay, is that out of the window, 
or uh, uh, can we still talk about that and so on because some of them uh, uh, of course I understand uh, you know, if we keep on uh, expanding the scope of the consultation it just will never end but uh, but uh, but then the, we have to be careful that uh, some some users uh, community may bring up those issues in the end and is it just that simple of telling them that hey no those questions we have already taken deal with, dealt with and so no problem don't don't talk about it anymore that that may not be a, a, a good way to deal with it I'm, I'm just want to make sure because because uh, even in the legislative council you cannot stop anyone from bringing up any of these matters back up anymore again so we uh, I just want to advise that uh, you know anyone who wants to see these the, this law being you know implemented and so on don't don't make that assumption uh, and uh, okay really a final final comment uh, uh, Peter talked about the foreign governments particularly maybe the US government and so on you know talking about the that they might want this law to be passed as it is and uh, start another round of consultation as soon as possible of course that's easy for them to say uh, in uh, Peter listed in their uh, from their document, I suppose, uh, some of the things that they want to see in uh, the urgent next round of consultation. Things like graduated response and uh, online border control and so on. And uh, what I want to say is that graduated response seems to be even failing in uh, France, right? And they 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 seem to be retreating. And uh, it's easy for the U.S. to say that we should be doing it for uh, let's say online border control, but they can't even get it passed in the U.S., right? So, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles, uh, for that really um, detailed and insightful well, thank you. Um, So clearly this is a, a very, very um, intense issue that affects a lot of people, and a lot of people have opinions on it and so forth. And I would love to hear some of the questions and opinions from the audience here. So do we have any uh, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Can you use the microphone, please? Hi, Peter. Um, just a quick question, since you brought up fair use in Singapore. Should the consultation really have been whether you use, whether to uh, promote fair use, to change the fair use regime to promote innovation, as is the case with Australia? Um, part of the reason, um, since you brought up Singapore, for focusing on f fair use and Singapore is that though they have gone to a fair use regime, they've also introduced the media law, so any benefit of going to fair use in terms of liberalized uh, tolerance of satire has now been uh, negated by the new media law. So sh would that have been a better approach, in your opinion? Um, well, it's, it's always difficult when you have the interaction between the different regulations. Right? So in Singapore, it's a very good example. So what, what I'll share with you is uh, Australia and Singapore. So Australia is very interesting because now it's considering adopting the fair use uh, approach taken by other countries. But when you look back on the previous revision or the previous consideration of revision, they decided that uh, the US approach is not good for Australia. Right? So when you look at now, I don't think a lot of things have changed in Australia other than things getting more and more expensive. Um, and so when they say that all of a sudden the US approach is much better, then uh, it raises the question as to whether they need to think about other things, for example, the development of IT. Uh, whenever I go to Europe a few years ago, one of the questions I always get is that, how come we cannot have our own Google, uh, Google uh, books? Or we cannot have others? Well, because one is about the limitation exception that they got is very narrow. Two, they don't have something like Silicon Valley, which are very willing to take risky ventures by providing capital, right? When you get a combination of this, uh, it makes it much more difficult. So a lot of times they are considering opening this up. Now, Singapore is, uh, is an interesting case because Singapore believes that they are not ready to establish fair, fair use. So what they did is that they have the fair dealing for any use other than that has already been covered in the other provisions, and then use the factors to be considered. And that's actually a response to the future agreement that Singapore has signed with the US. So what they're trying to do is to fold the fair use factors into the fair dealing so that it's more palatable within the cost system as well as within the, uh, the uh, uh, practicing community. 
And I think what's really important is not so much whether we should go for fair use or whether we should go for fair dealing, but to have an open-ended set of exceptions so that we can determine what type of needs we have, whether it's technological needs or whether it's a need for political commentary, uh, and then we can make the adjustment there. Now, if there are certain things we know we need for sure, for example, criticism, uh, research, education, then it's important for us to provide but at the same time, we already have that in the copyright ordinance. So what we are targeting is actually something that we don't know exactly whether we need at the moment or not. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, hello. Um, thank you, uh, Peter, for deleting a very thorough, a very thorough study of the uh, situation. And thank you for Charles bringing up the copyright industry's review of, um, in fact, it was the, uh, we are we propose to lift the criminal sanction, not the civil. Yeah, you you yeah, mentioned yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So uh, I sorry to draw value from today's discussion. I think the corporate industries would apologize for not making its views wide enough for people to understand and to fathom and to include in their into their thinking. The corporate industry is concerned not because of parity works. Mm -hmm. Concern on unlicensed activities bringing creation of new works. We have always harbored, accept derivative works. Those are always licensed. And in the context of parity exception, those are not licensed activities. If they claim the uh, creation of works, that is in big contrast to the copyright system we believe in and the belief system that will that drive the economic value of copper industries. So I think the government is doing the right thing. In fact, the two days uh, you bring up the timing problem of the uh, legislation is causing a lot of grievances, more and more problems coming up in Hong Kong. We don't pass the, the well, Charles bring up a point, whether the copper amendment 2011 would be uh, together packed with the parody to be passed as a new bill. We all hope we all hope so. Because this has been long negotiated and agreed between the different stakeholders. Um, we support creativity. We support parody. Use not the creation of um, new rights. They have the, they have creativity to accept. But in order for derivative works to be uh, exploited, it must be licensed. This is our position. And we hope that this message will come across to the users, internet users, that they understand that we are not after them. We support creativity. So I hope you would, you would contain some of our thinking into your presentation. Uh, I do apologize. The covering this viewpoint has never been publicized enough. Thank you. No, I think this is actually a very good way to, to state the position. And I'm actually very sympathetic to uh, that position, considering that I'm also an active author of publishing industry, and I can see why it's important. I think the difficulty is that with respect to non-commercial use, uh, getting a license is not that easy. Uh, there are a lot of transaction costs involved. If you're trying to contact TVB and say, can I get a license for me to make a parody for a school play <coughs> in Form 5, I bet you will not get a response from the general counsel, and that means you will not get the license at all. Right? or from the permission department, depending on what, who is doing the clearance. And I think that is a challenge. Right? With respect to commercial entities, uh, I agree with you, uh, although there's still difficulty. Using my example of TVA and TVB, I don't think TVB will grant a license, no matter how often TVA is willing to negotiate. Right? We are in a holdout situation. Uh, I think one of the difficulties is that when we say that, well, we w want to make sure that everything has to be licensed, we always assume that license uh, uh, the licensing transaction can be done, which is not always the case. Sometimes the transaction costs are so high that it doesn't make any sense. If a radio station has to contact every single record producer in order to get a license before they play a song, as opposed to a statutory license or based on collective management, it's going to be very time consuming to the point that it's almost impossible for them to play things uh, on demand. Another thing that is also quite important to think about is that the discussion is not just between those people who understand corporate language. And I think that's why a lot of my colleagues who are in the corporate industries have a tough time uh, getting the word out. 
uh, because they tend to one, they talk about a language that they assume everybody understand, and now we have the netizen community who actually have their own conception or what is considered as communication to a public. Right? When I know that it's from the, uh, the Weibo Copyright Treaty, I know that there's a special meaning, but that's not the case for a netizen. The other thing which I think is also the major problem with respect to corporate industry players is that they always remember what deals they have negotiated in the last round. I've been to a situation where they say, well, those are issues we already talked about five years ago, and we have all these players together, and we have settled it. Why are we reopening it? Well, but when you have other people uh, who are just finished high school, finished uh, college, and come out to use the content, they are not part of that discussion. And that makes it much more difficult for them to assume that everything has already been settled. And I think that makes it much more challenging. I, I just want to add one uh, point that Peter talked about the difficulty in the legal and the transaction costs and so on. The other problem is the or problem or the reality. The other reality is the ease of use of technology. Uh, that is a big, uh, whether you call it a, a positive, you look at it positively or negatively. Uh, that's the reality because, uh, uh, hey, if it's so easy to make a, a, a secondary creation uh, or derivative work, how do you stop people from doing it? That is, a, that is also a problem. And if you stop it from, uh, by, by purely legal, legal means and so on, and especially like Peter mentioned, most of these people are young kids and so on, then uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it, that's why uh, we keep on uh, talking about uh, uh, the uh, the the uh, uh, issue of uh, 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 leading to leading to uh, strike a balance, you know that that that's that's the reality. If it's something that's very difficult to stop, uh, 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 and we don't certainly want a society to put everyone in jail, then uh, or, or fine everybody a large sum of money, or uh, and so on, then you know uh, we probably have to look for a new regime. So I think we're in search of that sort of a balance. Yeah, and I think, Charles, um, you hit on a point here. And that is, what happens when the people who are engaging in this activity are part of a different mindset? Um, mm. The digital natives are different from the people who are actually making the laws today. They have different views on privacy, different views on usage, um, never pay for your music, you know, go online and so forth. So do you criminalize the activity of an entire generation or do you find some kind of balance through the education um, and, and certain uh, laws and so forth? It does sound that both of you conclude um, that nothing should be done. In other words, nothing. that no, no, no. If you don't do no, if you don't do anything, right? No, 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 no. Yeah. So that a lot of things should be should be done and looked at, but the option of doing nothing oh, is not sure, an option, sure, sure. right? Okay. So um, that the something has to be done, and that I think is why other countries have gone forward and have uh, from Canada, from Australia, from UK, and so forth, recognizing that you have to deal with this issue because society has changed. Um, in the way they communicate and the way they do expressions and so on. Um, other questions? Yes, Angelina. I just had a quick question about the user actually ties in Can really you use well. the microphone? Okay. Thank you. It ties in really well with what you just mentioned about the newer generations. My specific question was about um, economic impact on brands when they're being reviewed online. So for instance, a lot of, and that's user generated content. Um, big corporations, they love it when you review, when you can, you can use their pictures, you can use their logos, you can use their brands as long as you're giving good reviews. Quite often, um, if you're giving a negative review, whether that's on anonymously through Amazon or something, or entire websites that have been set up, say for instance by a fashion fanatic or a makeup fanatic, who takes pictures in his or her own home, say for instance of a certain brand, and then reviews them. In what in the scenarios that you've mentioned, where would something, where would the rights of a company fall, um, or the rights of the reviewer fall, um, to be able to say or protect themselves against, say, defamation and economic loss? Because if that's a very popular site or a very popular blog, the company could ultimately say that that has had an effect. There have also been some huge cases um, recently, for instance, in, in the U.S. with Tesla, the car that was reviewed by a journalist by the New York Times, and Tesla. Um, came back and said it wasn't reviewed properly. So this gray line of defama economic defama defamation online by many of us who think it's quite normal to go online and review a brand, a company, a restaurant, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. 
In in a lot of other countries, there is actually a very big issue with respect to hotel reviews, restaurants, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. I know that TripAdvisor has actually been asked to uh, either allow them to respond or take down some of those uh, things that are posted by people who actually cannot be identifiable. Uh, and I think it's quite important for a lot of those uh, intermediaries that provide those websites to allow for people to be able to respond. Uh, if you ask me between a user and a company, for example, let's say Ford, they make cars that are okay, but not really good, and people are unhappy with it. I would say that uh, they have more resources, they have a bigger forum to respond, uh, they can always have advertising, and I don't think that we should allow those major players to be able to sue others for uh, economic defamation, especially uh, for a user. The whole analysis will be somewhat different if you talk about a competitor trying to hire a lot of people to actually badmouth uh, the com competing brand, right? But at the same time, I think with respect to uh, the issues we got here, I don't think there'll be an easy way to deal with it. But one thing I want to add is that if you are going to uh, criticize uh, work done by a corporate holder, the current fair dealing provision will already allow you to do that with respect to criticism. And so I don't think that's a new issue. I think there's a tendency for us when we get the corporate consultation, we always assume that well, there are so many possible scenarios. But if you actually read the corporate ordinance, you find that well, a lot of them have already been included, including the uh, public policy uh, limitation. It's right there, except that, uh, uh, that a lot of people just say, well, maybe if you put it in that particular section, that would be a little bit better. Uh, but at the same time, you don't really want to have like a phone book type of corporate ordinance because it will be very difficult for people to read. You talk about phone book. Can I? Can we yes. have all of the above? Can you answer that? I, oh, I, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so, so the, the 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 two things I wanted to respond. One is the all of the above and some more, right? Yeah. Uh, the reason why I think option four will not be all inclusive is because it's only for non-commercial. Whereas for parody, it can be for commercial as well. Right, as long as there's no prejudice, uh, prejudicial effect. So I think option four will not include that. The other one which you mentioned about technology, you can also see on the bright side linking together with the, the great question you asked about licensing, uh, is that well, technology can help to develop a licensing culture, make it easier for people to get it. One of the, thing, one of the beauty of the uh, content verification system from YouTube is that you can cl say that, well, I want this song, uh, to actually replace so that the author or the corporate holder will get some licensing revenue, right? So you can, it is possible to do it. The frustration I have is that a lot of the major corporate industries believe that, well, you don't have this option until we are ready to include this. And a lot of people actually want it now. And I think that makes it difficult, not necessarily saying which one is wrong, but at the same time, it's, it's very frustrating considering that you get this group of people who are willing to allow licensing revenues to go to corporate holders. Uh, if you ask around, I bet, uh, actually, let me ask around. How many of you are in support of large scale corporate infringement? See? We have agreement, right? What we disagree is that we draft the statute to a point that the criminal net is so large that it covers both large scale infringement and other activities. From the standpoint of the corporate holders, if we draw it large enough so that we can close every loophole, that's a good thing. From the standpoint of the consumers, is that, well, if it's large enough, how do we know we will not accidentally fall into this net? And I think that the, the frustration for those of us who are in, in the intellectual world field is that well, it's not necessarily a good thing that if we keep on not having the agreement over this issue. If you remember the 2006 consultation, it's about P2P file sharing. Yeah. That's not a big issue anymore, right? <laughs> and so now it's some, something different. And I think the more they're willing, to, they, the more they realize that most people are against large scale corporate infringement and try to tackle that problem. And I think the more likely they will be able to do that. But if they're going to say, well, we want to make sure that everything will be licensed or we want to make sure that there will not be uh, some s scenarios that might be covered, then I think you drag on for a long time to a point that you will not benefit anybody. Yes. Okay. Uh, Peter, I just want to ask a few questions. The first is very simple, just follow what you said. For large scale infringement, um, 
That means we do not agree that making, making a fin an infringing copy of a web available in the internet will not be amount to a large scale in infringement, even though it's a million hit okay, to, to that copyright, uh, infringing copyright. For example, the, just, just what we say here. Uh, let's, let's go crazy, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go crazy, it's not a parody, it's not fall within the exception, any fair dealing exception. But you make the whole song unavailable. The people look at it as ridicule, but the whole song has been copied, basically, right? And you tell me, and you're suggesting that it's not a large scale infringement. When thousands and thousands of people like, is look at the, uh, the kid, right, and listen to the music. If it's a large scale infringement, they will fall within your definition of criminal sanction, right? Now, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that it is, okay, but just, just follow your logic, sure, okay? Sure. Now, the second thing is, true parody. Will you agree with me that for the true parody, that we, we need two requirements. First requirement, it, it must be no substitution for the original work, right? If there's a substitution, it cannot be a true parody, right? It has to be, because this is U.S. law, every, every basic the case law established there, right? No, it would be a parody, but that would not be considered fair use. Yeah, I agree. No, I'm, yeah. I'm talking about exactly, fair deal exactly. No, right? in terms of definition, it can yeah. be a parody. It just I agree, would not I agree, be fair I agree. But in terms of uh, whether in uh, attracting any civil or criminal liability, it's two different things, right? It's a parody by definition, but it will not be within the vet. You cannot have it, you cannot substitute the original work, okay? That's the, uh, um, the, 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 the OP, uh, uh, the, the case is the accused case. Accused is accused. 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 You suggest that the fair use factor is equally, right? Well, no, the, the fourth factor is commercial, okay? Basically, even though it's a long commercial, you affect the interest of the, um, of the, uh, the copy owner. Would that be considered as a fair use in the U.S.? So uh, the first question is simple, because let's, let's go crazy, is actually having music play in the background, right? So it's very hard to say that you have music in a play, uh, so why you choose this music in the first place, right? I mean, basically... No, the, because the radio is playing that, and the oh, okay. baby is dancing to it. Yeah, but right? So there's no control. Is, not, I know, but that's not right. mean that you can copy, right? No, in he was just... Have, he has no interest. I know, I know, I know. Right? So can you just change the background? Uh, okay, so, so how would intention. you... Anyway, I'm not you on, no, no, I'm not going to be on this issue, okay? So the second issue is very simple. That, that's why you call the YouTube exception, right? Basically, you do, even the YouTube exception still have qualification on this, right? You cannot have adverse sure. impact. So basically we agree that is it a commercial impact, okay? Adverse commercial impact on the equivalent user. It cannot be exempt anyway. Uh, under the exception, yes. Yeah, must be. A anyway, the law, don't tell me that US is not the same approach, okay? US is the same thing. You, are, you have a commercial impact on the, even on the DVD market, okay? Now the, the reason I'm bringing this up is very simple. The secondary creation is fine, okay? But if, if the secondary creation for the secondary market or the other market, I don't think it's fine, right? That means if I copy your work and then try to create something new, okay, and then I sell it and make a lot of money, I don't think that is fine, okay? Basically, and our, our copyright law anywhere in the world. But for the purpose of fair dealing, for example, true parody, yes, nobody will argue with this because there's no substitution of the original work, right? For the original work, there's no substitution. We don't worry about this, right? But the question is, most of the time, they, 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 they try to tell the people this is a parody, but actually it's a substitution. Then we're in trouble. Well, a substitution is where I'm willing to draw the line, but let me give you an example that will respond to both your second question and third question. There's a novel called Call of the Wind, which has been made into a movie, and there's a parody called The Wind and Gone, which is by S. Randall. Right? So, uh, would there be commercial impact on the uh, estate of the author? The answer would be yes, because when people are reading The Wind and Gone, they realize how racist the author is, right? So is that commercial impact? Under the U.S. law, the answer would be yes. Yeah, would that be because... It's a parody. It's a parody. It's, it's a parody, uh, even though they are... Look for parody in this case, you are target on the author. 
not on the, the first subject matter, right? Not not against our C Y, okay? So so that it will be subject to criticism, right? right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I know you might want to answer right. this. So I just I just want to make sure that, I, and you raise some really valid points, and perhaps the two of you can continue discussion okay. afterwards. Um, <laughs> how long are you going to say? I'm saying. Uh, yes, of course, of course. Um, but I just want to make sure we give opportunities to anyone else in the audience. Um, any other questions for our, our speakers here? Um, and anyone from government have anything to say? <laughs> Why don't, why don't you announce uh, when is the submission deadline and also wh whether you are ha having any upcoming forum? I think there's a forum in September. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. So, um, yes, the consultation starts on the 11th of July, and um, we are think we are halfway through the consultation period, and we are holding public forum to invite views from the members of the public. The next one will be on the 22nd of September uh, in Kaolu, in Cultural Center. We welcome everyone to join us and to share us with the views. Uh, actually, I'm very grateful for um, Professor Yu and Charles for the sharing of your views. I think it's very in-depth. Um, we learned a lot from you. Just like a student in campus, we, are, we all are students, humble students before chair professors. <laughs> and um, I'm grateful to Charles for the wise counsel about uh, what you have done in order to bridge the gap between um, the government and, uh, and the netizens. I think one important thing I agree that is this is an important balancing exercise for us all. And the option not to change is not an option at all. I think this is very important. And of course, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's on the government's shoulder to really to find a way of how best to balance the interests of different parties. Thank you. Thank you so much. And also, um, if you can uh, mention to your colleagues that we will be posting um, this uh, talk, and uh, they can share and, and watch it as well. Great. Yeah. Any uh, final comments from our two speakers? Uh, I think there will be another forum. Uh, what's the date? Uh, government choose 26. Okay, 22nd. Okay, and uh, 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 September, right? Uh, and uh, I actually am also going to be ho holding another session in Cantonese. Uh, we've been inviting uh, uh, people from the internet users community and so on to to talk with us. Uh, unfortunately, Peter will be back in the U.S. by then uh, on the 14th. On the <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah, we can fly you back. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, 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 but anyway, uh, uh, on the 14th, and uh, we'll be in uh, Poly U. So, uh, uh, but uh, Alice will be there. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, so uh, hope you will join. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Obviously, um, this raises so many really important issues here, as others have as well. Um, and Hong Kong is, um, like the rest of the world, trying to struggle and deal with these. And yet, Hong Kong also has its own unique set of circumstances that the law obviously tries to deal with. Thank you so much for coming. And um, please uh, do check our website for any follow-up that we have on this. Thank you.